Sounds like you're suggesting we take a life course perspective? <laughs> so um, I just discovered I'm, I'm really delighted to be uh, assigned the role of reactor, even though I didn't know that until Tuesday night. Um, so it's truly going to be a reaction uh, written in real time. Uh, and there were so many things to react to. Uh, so it, I wouldn't say that I have it all boiled down. I, I'm, I'm hoping that I'll pose a few uh, questions that haven't been brought up or that have been brought up, and uh, I will just underscore them. I do want to say I, I came partly because I do believe in uh, the importance of HTE. That's the heterogeneity of tie effect. So you, you'll notice in the morning I did not have a tie because on the East Coast, that's a more informal way of interacting with individuals. But if you want people to actually uh, believe in your authority, you have to put one on when you're addressing a group. On the West Coast, there's heterogeneity because it's the opposite. If you put on a tie on the West Coast, you're completely irrelevant. Uh, so, so you're much better you know, coming in with, you know, looking like you just came off a tri triathlon or that you've wrecked another industry last week. Um, so that, that, that's the way to get people to listen. To you, so I'm on the East Coast, so I so I put one on. Uh, now I have a, a a bunch of perspectives. You know, everybody puts up disclosures. So uh, one of my roles is as vice chair of the uh, methodology committee. I'm also work as a I have a perspective of a journal editor. Worked at Annals for many decades. Uh, I also work with Naomi Aronson at the, uh, with the medical advisory panel at Blue Cross Blue Shield. So they're a payer doing a project for FDA. It was a regulator. And of course, my life is completely insecure because actually I'm an academic. Um, and at one time, I was a, a pediatrician. Uh, and when you view this problem through all those perspectives, you get dizzy because actually the problem doesn't look the same. And that's what we heard today when we listened to patients and we listened to statisticians and we listened uh, to the to the monitors and the practitioners. So I think the purpose of this meeting is to get as many perspectives out as possible, but I don't think it's possible in this short period of time to get them all fully aligned. And I'll point out some of the, the tensions that, that I see. Um, I will say I'm a student but not a scholar of the issues uh, today. I'm very interested in them, uh, partly because what I am more a scholar of is of sort of foundations of scientific and biomedical inference, which is how do we know that the things we say are true? And that's actually, I would say, what the, is the fundamental dilemma today. It actually reminds me of um, you know, a, fun, a comment that was made about, you know, can you summarize uh, the Bible teachings in one sentence? And it said, you know, do unto others what you'd have them do unto you, and everything else is commentary. And, and I feel like that's what's going on here today. There are these foundational issues. I was very interested that Dave Kent started with Reichenbach and, and Venn because there are these foundational issues in the nature of the fundamental uncertainties that we face when we do science that we cannot get around. And, and two of them are what is the meaning and measurement of causality, as uh, Anurban Basu pointed out before, it's not in the data. Whether one phenomenon that's predicted by another phenomenon is causal is not found in the data. So we have to bring other things to the data to determine causality. I won't give a speech on that. And the other thing that's really I interesting is the, the very fundamental nature of and problematic nature of risk and probability. And again, Dave pointed out right at the beginning, what is a risk? So you know, if, if I have Joe over here, I can, in theory, measure his weight, his height, you know, any physical characteristic about him is LDL, you name it. But when we say, what is Joe's risk? We can't measure that in him. We have to measure it in people like him. And then we say that's his risk. Well, actually, that in itself is a huge leap to say that that's his risk. So it's, not a, it's one of the only biomedical properties, perhaps the only medical property, that we cannot measure in the individuals. We must take a group around them, and we measure a property of that group, and we assign it to that person. Then the question is, well, what's the right group? And this is, again, what Dave started off with the reference class. It turns out that the right group is the group defined by the causal factors of the phenomenon that you're studying. What are the causes? Now we're in a circle. So th this is an irreducible dilemma. Th we will always be faced with this dilemma. And I'll point out how many of the debates that we've had here today are just transmuting this dilemma into other questions. And, and let's see if I can successfully uh, do that. So one of the worries um, in 
in the um, decision to, to uh, start developing risk stratification or risk prediction tools uh, in every RCT is that what we will have is a proliferation of these risk predictions based on every RCT, which is why it's so critical to have sort of standard risk prediction tools, but we have not developed those in most, if any, areas. So what will happen, which is already, we've already seen it happen in the genetic risk prediction area, is that we will get these different risk predictors. I know that's not me. Uh, we will have these, uh, what I worry about, and, and I toss this out for our consideration, is what we'll have a proliferation of risk predictors, each one coming from a different uh, study or pool of studies or for a particular pool of interventions and one particular outcome. And then we'll wonder about not which risk group any particular uh, patient falls into, because as we pointed out, if we do binary risk stratification, a, a patient could be in an infinite number of binary risk groups. They could also be in an infinite number of prediction equations, right? They could all be in different sets that were defined in different trials. So this, the notion that there will be a unique way, or I should, let me phrase it in a more positive way, coming to agreement on what are the optimal state-of-the-art prediction models, and, and here I'll even just talk about prognostic models, um, is going to be a huge challenge because, we, again, it was suggested, well, why don't we demand that in every single trial we do this risk prediction and benefit, um, benefit prediction? And uh, we're going to have to be very, I think we're going to have to be very, very careful about how we do that. Uh, and then to the extent that it's predictive and not just prognostic, even more difficult. Because I think th then we're getting into the issues of causality. And there's a reason why RCTs were developed to assess causal effects. And as we start to move away from the RCT model, we're going to find ourselves in a, in a I don't want to say a heap of trouble, because I think that there's a lot of benefits to become. But we're going to have to be very, very, very careful as we migrate from the from inf causal inferences based on randomization to causal inferences based on models. And that's not going to, that, it, 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 and I think a number of people have pointed this out. So the issue of what's the relevant risk group is, going to, is transmuting into what's the relevant risk equation. And the issue of what is the predicted benefit is now the new way we ask about how do we simulate, in a sense, an RCT around this prediction. And, and that's, again, not very easy. I do, oh, do want to say there's a link to research reproducibility here and that we're really asking why some of these studies show benefit and others don't. Um, I will say that some of it and, uh, is really just found, as, as clinical trialists have long known, in the eligibility criteria. And the eligibility criteria themselves are an initial reference class. So they are the initial guess at what group will potentially be of benefit, because they are the group that we think might uh, get this therapy. If we start deviating from that reference class and saying that only certain ones of these are going to benefit, then we have this question of, should we or do we focus future RCTs only on that subgroup? Or do we do the reverse? Do we expand the eligibility criteria for the, uh, for the RCTs because we want to get information on treatment benefit for everybody. So I think there was an unspoken tension here about whether we restrict treatment or we expand treatment or whether we restrict eligibility criteria or we expand eligibility criteria. So I think there's, both, there's tension both between the class of patients that we in, in, induct into clinical trials but also that we, how we treat them, uh, how we care for them. And, and I think there were arguments I heard both ways uh, saying it should be larger or it should be smaller. And, and I'm not sure exactly which way that cuts. Um, let's see. I will reinstate my, my comment before uh, about the issue of collective population benefit. And this also gets to the, the, payer, you know, the, the, the payer models and, and, and also paying for value. It's, it's a little unclear. Uh, I think it's going to be different condition by condition, treatment by treatment, whether you get the most population benefit from treating the low risk, the 90% the, the in the low risk 
or the 10% in the high risk and exactly where you set that cut point to best calibrate it. Obviously, as you set it down, as you include more and more of the, when I should say low risk, I should say low benefit. Um, the, 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 the more you treat the patients in what you think, what you think are the low benefit um, part of the spectrum, the, the greater chance that obviously harm, uh, that, they're, that you're going to get, the harm will outweigh any benefit. So we should talk about, you know, net benefit over harm. So I'll just talk about the spectrum of net benefit over harm, assuming that everybody on that spectrum has positive net benefit if you don't want to harm them. But in any case, it still could be the case that, um, that by only focusing on the highest benefit parts of that spectrum, you're, you're actually not optimizing the population benefit. And, and, and where and how we set that cut point uh, might be an issue of politics. It might be an issue of economics. But it's not a given mathematically where that tra how and where that trade-off uh, needs to be. Um, I think uh, Frank Harrell made an interesting point that uh, heter you know, HTE shouldn't be used to rescue failed trials. Uh, and I know he doesn't believe in bright line binary reasoning, so he doesn't literally think they're failed trials. Uh, uh, but I would say, why not? It, it can't cut both ways. I mean, if we're going to find the successful trials and find the populations where it doesn't work, why couldn't there be subpopulations and trials that show moderate effects that are not statistically significant that are actually benefiting? I, I actually think it's reciprocal. Now, there may be resource reasons why we don't want to do that. But that also gets, you know, then we're, then we're up against um, all sorts of issues in the re regulatory framework and, and, and the interests of some forces to, to show efficacy where there, there might not be. But I, I don't know that the, I'm worried about saying that we can't use it just from a logical standpoint. And I would love to see more discussion of that. Um, and then to echo, Naomi and Rod Hayward and Katrina, um, I, I do think that um, how much of care settings and social factors need to be incorporated into these models is, again, a very open question. And it's one that every caregiver knows, uh, sometimes because they just know how the world works. You know that if the person is not, going, is not in a social setting where they can monitor themselves or they can take the meds or they can afford the meds or they can be monitored appropriately for harm, that's a setup for disaster. We just know it. We know it. We don't, you know, you, you know it just from you know, go to someone's home or your own home. Uh, so uh, the, what looks, you know, beautiful mathematically, we're going to have to see how it works in practice. So what does this mean in terms of what we do? Uh, I think we can't get away from saying we have to do RCTs on the use of these models themselves. And I think a few people said that. We just have to. And I don't actually, uh, uh, Mike said we, he didn't think we were ready culturally for it. I actually literally don't know what that means. Uh, I do think the, the door is wide open here. I, I mean, the, the uncertainty around med med many medications or health services practices that we test in RCTs all the time. This looks much more promising than those, but we, we have to have an RCT where you're random, just like any diagnostic test, even though we do too few RCTs on diagnostic tests, where you're randomized to, you know, or a clinical pathway using the model where some people might not get treated, and another one where they don't use the model at all. Just follow the RCT guidelines. Let's see what happens. We, I don't see any way out of that. But that gets to using the RCT, because that's the only technology we really have one way or the other. Um, uh, I will say we've done two to three decades of work, uh, still not done, in trying to figure out the quality of evidence from RCTs and observational studies. I don't know that we're even at the beginning of how to judge the quality of the evidence uh, right now for benefit from these models. So how, how are we going to grade recommendations on treating high-risk patients or treating patients with a particular multifactorial uh, benefit, risk benefit profile from these models. I, I mean, I don't want to say I don't have a clue. I have only a clue, <laughs> barely a clue. But we're, we're going to have to get into that business. And uh, we, have to th we should th be thinking about it now. Because if we can't figure out what the reliability of this evidence is, uh, we'll be you know, caught on the same horns of the dilemma that, um, that the guideline developers were in the 70s and 80s when we were first starting to learn about uh, relying on, on observational data and clinical trials of varying quality. Uh, I do think we have to develop prognostic and prediction models in multiple RCTs, and I think getting more access to individual patient data, we heard that. Uh, and I think um, 
Evelyn will talk more about that, will be fantastically informative. Also, getting information on how consistent these models are going to be. I do wonder whether we're going to have, a, have to have different prediction models by treatment, by outcome, by measurable and non-measurable factors, and, um, and the way we code them as well. And, you know, how much can be are apparent from EMRs, how much are available from ICD codes, I don't know. Um, and then the, I guess I think we'll, I'll end just saying if getting MDs to follow the very simple rules and dictates of, of RCTs and systematic reviews is so difficult, I, I worry a lot uh, for the prospect of implementation of these far more complex uh, guidelines. And we heard here uh, that even the simplest actual recommendations are, are, are applied with seemingly completely chaotic chaotically, uh, almost no matter how hard you try in care settings. And we're going to have to think, and again, this was made, uh, mentioned by a number of people, uh, what it would mean to substitute this for the RCT. It's very, very easy, I think, to, to criticize um, what I'll call simple-minded or simplistic policies until you start thinking of alternative policies and how they'll implement. I, I often think of this with respect to the FDA. There are many of their policies that uh, you would say, I could do better. but. When you start to concoct a real-world policy that's going to be subject to gaming and pressure and every effort to get around them and all the complexities of the real world, you find out, hmm, maybe that made sense as a policy. You know, maybe it's not what you come up with an equation on paper, but, but we don't always have that uh, uh, luxury. So I think we need a research agenda on these models, a practice and implementation agenda. And here I'm just reflecting back what I heard. Uh, we need a performance overlord agenda. <laughs> we need a payer agenda. Figure out how to, you know, whether the use of these things should be, uh, uh, whether, whether they should guide what's reimbursed. Uh, a patient decision-making agenda. And in fact, I think uh, we need uh, a political agenda. Because this is a different paradigm for the, the knowledge basis for on how we treat. And um, that has already uh, been... Uh, the, the, the way forward has already been, the, I, that ice has already been broken with precision medicine uh, paradigm and the promise of that. But uh, I think about 95% of that is hype. So uh, we have to be careful that we, we focus on the, the meat here and, and that we actually use these in a way that, that does more good than harm. And I'll pass my, the baton over to Evelyn. Thanks.